That's pretty good, but you can do better. Good morning. There you go. Solomon says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Not my words, it's Solomon's. And the Bible says he's pretty smart. You know what that means? It means everything about you is either breathing life or it's breathing death. That's what it means. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. There's just two kinds of people in this world. Life breathers and death breathers. That's it. The, world, the world's built on win and lose. You wear that? I mean, I work with college athletes. I work with them um, over here in your state a lot. In fact, uh, your new head coach over here at Louisiana Tech uh, had the privilege of doing his marriage counseling when he got married a few years ago. His dad, Spike Dykes, is one of my dear friends, and I've known Sonny a long time, and uh, do a lot of things over here with, uh, with La Tech. I'm in your state a lot with FCA. But I work with college athletes, Texas Tech. I've been working with them for 21 years, uh, Texas A&M. Texas, Nebraska, University of Oklahoma, teams around the country. I'll tell you more about that. But uh, sometimes people say, well, you know what? You're just competitive because you work with athletes. No, that's why we like sports. That's why sports is, is the most popular part of the entertainment world, okay? And the reason is because it's the closest thing to reality. See, the reality of the world is it's win and lose. I'm sorry, but read the Bible. The Bible's not built on why can't we all just get along. The Bible's not built on that. The Bible's built on win and lose. I'm sorry, but it's heaven and hell. There's no, there's no ties. You can't find a tie in the, in the Bible. Jesus said you're either the children of your father in heaven or your children of your father the devil. There's no ties. On the day of judgment, it's going to be divided up into two groups, sheep and goats. There are no armadillos and porcupines. It's sheep and goats. That's it, right? It's light and darkness. Now you say, man, but, but that sounds harsh. You know why it's not harsh? Because everybody can be a winner. Because nobody has to lose. That's in your power. Listen, man, nobody has to lose. It's God's will that none perish and that all come to everlasting life. What that means is God says, man, you can be a winner because being a winner doesn't have anything to do with the color of your skin. It's got nothing to do with whether you're a man or you're a woman, whether you're tall or short, whether you have a Ph.D. or you have a G.D., you speak English or Spanish. It's got nothing to do with the way you look. I mean, when I was a young athlete, I had a six-pack and a big brown mullet. Now at 54, I got a keg and a skullet. I mean, that's what I got. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean... It's got nothing to do with whether you got a mullet or a skullet. I mean, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with whether you're a musician or a non-musician. These guys are great. But the bottom line is, it has to do with what's here and what's here. And if the right stuff is here and the right stuff is here, everybody can be a winner. Now, what that means is this. What's in a man comes out of a man. Now, what comes out of you is the what you really are. Look, what you say doesn't mean anything. I mean, you students that are here, I hope you learn early. You don't listen to what people say. The boy that cried wolf told the truth. You know why nobody listened to him? Because it wasn't who he was. In the end, you want to know who people are? Watch them. Because the truth is, you is what you is, and you are what you are, and when you get squeezed, you do what you do. And a smart person don't listen to nothing you say, man. They just watch to see what comes out of you when you get squeezed. And if it's life, then you're worth following. If it's death, steer clear of them, man. Look, when people talk, all they're telling you is what they want you to think they are, what they'd like to be, or what they wish they were. The truth is, you is what you is, and you are what you are. That's just the truth. And if what comes out of you when you get squeezed, and life's going to squeeze you, man, life's going to come at you. And when life comes at you, what comes out of you? Is it life or is it death? Listen, man, life and death is the power of the tongue. Everybody in this room, you're either a supernova who spews life all over northwest Louisiana. Because when you get squeezed, good or bad, what comes out of you is life, baby. Or, man, you are a death breather. You are a black hole sucking energy off of three rows of pews in this, in this room right now. Now, which are you? You a life breather, you a death breather. Nobody wants to hang out with death breathers, brother. Nobody wants to hang with, li with, dead, with, the, with the black holes. Listen, man, nobody wants to buy anything from a black hole. Nobody wants to be coached by a black hole. Nobody wants to sit in class under a black hole. And I guarantee you this, nobody wants to be married to a black hole. Amen? Isn't that true? Some of you say, can we talk? No, you made your bed. You're going to have to sleep in it. Let's encourage kids not to make the same mistake. Now, here's the bottom line, okay? You want to grow anything? You want anything to be successful? You've got to breathe life on it. Look, man, are you an energy producer or are you an energy uh, consumer? Everybody in this room, you're one of the two. Are you the person the pastor loves to see coming because you are a life breather and then you're an energy producer? You see opportunities, not problems. He loves to see you coming because you've got answers. Are you the black hole that when he sees you walking toward him, he ducks in the men's room because if there's any bad news within 50 miles, you want to be the first one to deliver it? Which one are you in your marriage? If you're a black hole, I thank God I'm not married to you. You wear people out. You a black hole, you a supernova. Everybody in this room is either an Eeyore or you're a Tigger. People want to hang out with the Tiggers, brother. That's who they want to hang out with. Now, we got a revival happening. I know that it's uh, close to Christmas, but to tell you the truth, 
I want to tell you something, more people out there in the secular world are thinking about God right now than any time of the year. Amen. This is a great time to have a revival. Last week I was in Katy, Texas. We had 25 people get saved. Let me tell you something. It could happen this week right here in Louisiana, but it's going to be up to you. But you're going to have to be life breathers, baby. You're going to have to breathe some life. Can't breathe death. People don't want to hang out with, with uh, death breathers. People don't want to hang out with uh, Eeyores. People want to hang out with Tiggers, brother. That's who they want to hang out with. Now, we got a chance to be some Tiggers. Now, I want to find out if you're a life breather or a death breather one more time. Man, you got visitors in here. Let's find out. So they go out and say, best place to be in the entire world on a Sunday morning is Bell Park Baptist Church in Louisiana. Let's see. You ready? Good morning. Good morning. Now, that's the kind of church people want to join. I'm telling you. And anybody that offended... Brother wasn't going to join today anyway. I guarantee you that, okay? We need to love deadbeats. They don't need to be in charge, right? Needs to be life breathers. Now, if we're going to breathe life on your community for these next four days, here's what we got to do. Then we'll get in the Word of God. Number one, man, you're going to have to be here, okay? You're going to have to be here. If we're going to do something these four days, and there is absolutely no point in wasting each other's time and God's time. It's planned. Let's make her work, okay? And I know you're in. I can tell. Here's the deal. you got to be here. Nothing can happen to this church and this community that you don't let happen to you. Look, when I'm speaking to these college teams, I remind them, I'm sorry, but there is no such thing as a longhorn. You say, what do you mean? Texas longhorns? There's no such thing as a longhorn. Longhorn's a cow. He ain't going to do nothing on a given Saturday afternoon. Bevo's future is a double meat hamburger in a, in a uh, McDonald's someplace. I'm sorry, he's a cow. You can't count on the cow. I look at those individual athletes and say, you've got to step up your game. I've been doing chapel for the Red Raiders for 21 years, and it's kind of a tradition with us the first game. But I always tell them, I'll say, there's no such thing as a Red Raider. And they smile because it's one of our team traditions. And I'll say, I'll say, there's no such thing as a Red Raider. You can't count on him this afternoon. The Red Raider is a freshman student in a Zorro costume. He ain't going to do nothing today. And then you point at, uh, you point at the players, and you look at, uh, you look at uh, Michael Crabtree, and you say, Crab, you've got to step up your game. Then you look over to Graham Harold and say, Graham, you've got to step up your game. Or you look at a Baron Batch and say, Baron, you've got to step up your game. And Baron will say, that's right, brother. You know why? Because I'm going to tell you something, man. In the end, the group is no stronger than the individuals. Our God is not a tribal God of tribal faith. Our God is an individual God of individual faith. And when individuals step up, it changes tribes. You hear me? Look, there is no such thing as Bell Park Baptist Church, if you all know the honest truth. That's a title on a piece of paper so you don't have to pay taxes on this property. That's all it is. You know what Bell Park is? It's you. There's no power in this building. I've seen a thousand of them look just like it. You, you, you got the power, not the building. So this week, if you step up your game, something happens. If you don't step up your game, nothing's going to happen. And they say, but it's a busy time of year. It's all busy. Busy people make the world go round. People ain't busy this week. Ain't going to get nothing done anyhow. Busy people get her done. So it's just like a ball game. Tonight, 5 o'clock, first quarter. Tomorrow, second quarter. Tuesday's third quarter, Wednesday's fourth quarter. Anybody who works with athletes know you've got to show up for all four quarters and win a ball game. Dallas Cowboys didn't show up for a third quarter until last week. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the reason that Jerry Jones' Super Bowl is not going to be hosting the Dallas Cowboys this year. Because you cannot show up for two quarters or three quarters and expect to win a ball game in the NFL or in anything in life. What planet are you from thinking that way? So here's the deal. Tonight's first quarter. Let's be here. Tomorrow night, change some things. Cancel some things. You know why lost people don't come to church? Because you're the members of the club, and it's the bottom of your radar. Amen. Then when you invite people, they don't even listen to you. Because it don't mean nothing to you, so why should it mean something to them? What if they watched you actually change your schedule this week? What if they actually watched you adjust your life and put your God and your church up at the top of the list for four days? Then you invite them, there's a real good chance they'd come because they'd like to know what was important enough to you to change your schedule. When you never change your schedule, people don't listen to you. Anybody in sales knows that. I'm teaching you power if you're listening. Let's be here this week. I know you're busy. Do your best. We're going to be in the schools. But students, us being in the schools is going to help. But I guarantee you, man, you still got to invite your friends. Because I don't have any power, you got it. And that leads to the next thing, and that is, number two on this list, is how about you make a decision that you're going to bring folks with you. Look, my freshman year at Texas Tech, Billy Graham came to Jones Stadium, 
And in eight nights, I got to see eight of my friends get saved. Now, that set my ministry, getting to work with the Graham people in the year leading up to that. And during that, that really set my ministry, okay? But I want to tell you something, okay? None of those eight men who got saved came for Billy Graham. They didn't know Dr. Graham. They respected him. They'd heard of him. But they didn't come for him. No freshman at Texas Tech was going to show up at the stadium because there was a billboard or a radio spot or a TV ad about Billy Graham. No, man, that just made them aware it was happening. I still had to go, and I had to talk to my friends, and I had to use a little friend pressure and say, do this for me. They didn't do it for Dr. Graham. They didn't know Dr. Graham. They did it for me. I was the one with the power. And when they got there, God touched them, and those men are walking with God to this very day. That was a life-changing event. But you know what? It took me reaching out to my friends. Look, there's nobody in this community that cares I'm here except preacher because none of you know me, and that's just fine. I'm just telling you, I got no power here. This is your town. Bluntly, I'm not responsible for your town. You are. They're your neighbors. They're your teammates. If you're a teacher, they're your students or your players. Listen, man, if you're a student, it's your coach. This is your town. This is your school. This is your community. You got all the power. But what you got to do is you got to take these four days out of the norm and you got to say, for four days, I'm going to do my best to invite everybody that I can. Now, I'll tell you what will happen. Some of them will say yes, some of them will say no, but all of them will want to know what's important enough for you to have gotten outside your normal box. When you don't change your schedule or activities, no one listens to you. It's like putting new paint on old paint. It just peels off. You have to sand up the old paint for the new paint to stick. You have to get outside the box. That's, that's basic success 101. And bottom, you say, but yeah, you're no Billy Graham. That's true. But you know, the Bible says it's not the speaker, it's the Word of God that never returns void. Isn't that true? God can use a bad speaker. God used Balaam's donkey one time to speak a word. Isn't that right? If God could use a donkey, God could use your pastor. I mean, he could pretty well use anybody. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that true? Isn't that true? He could use me. But you know what? You could have Moses preaching and Jesus singing and ain't nobody going to get saved unless you bring your friends because they won't be here. Can I tell you something? You invite them, some of them will come. I'll invite my friends. I got a lot of friends in Shreveport and Bossier. I'm over here a lot. Got a lot of friends over in Ruston. I'll get my friends here the best I can. You get your friends here. And I guarantee you we'll have a good four days. And then here's the third thing. Quickly, we'll get into the Word. Third thing is, you can't just be here and bring folks. You've got to believe it's going to happen. God's a gentleman in the sense that He only works where people want Him to. You say, what do you mean? The Bible says God gives the desire of the heart. You know what that means? It means God ain't going to make you successful if you don't want to be. You hearing me? That's an important lesson to learn in life. Somehow you get to thinking that success is owed you. It's not. And you get what you pay for. And the facts are, if you put a little bit in, you get a little bit out. Man, you've got to plan the win. You know why the same teams are top ten teams year after year? Brother, they think they belong there and they plan the win. You go onto the field not sure if you can win, you can't. Look, if you don't think you can stay morally pure, students, you can't. I hear kids all the time say, well, there's so much peer pressure. And I look at them and say, I work with college students, man, across America. I say, I'll be with USC in Los Angeles, their students, uh, New Year's Eve for a big event up at Big Bear. Let me tell you something about students, okay? If you don't think you can keep your clothes on, you're correct, you can't. You'll get them off. But be blunt about it. You planned your loss, you planned it. You planned your failure. So guess what? You will fail because you're going to get the desire of your heart. You want to get your clothes off? You'll find a way to get them off, brother. You want to keep your clothes on and be morally pure and be a testimony at this school? Greater is he that's in you than any power that's in this world. You can keep your clothes on, but you've got to plan the win. Look, you don't get in a car with somebody without knowing what you will and won't do. You never go in the door of a party without knowing exactly what you will and won't do. You don't go on a party. You don't go on a date not sure about what you'll do. You got that win planned before you ever get in the car, before you ever said yes to the date, before you ever go to the party. That's how you win. You plan your win, dude. You, you get in a car with somebody, not sure what you'll do, you're dead meat. It's just a matter of time. If that's what you want, take responsibility for yourself. Quit blaming others. It ain't free. It ain't nothing free. You can quit drinking. You can quit doing meth. You can back in, get back in and fight for your marriage. You can get out of debt. Listen, man, for us adults, debt's destroying our homes. 
We're addicted to spending more money than we make. It's just a matter of time until it destroys you. That's just the facts. And you get as addicted to spending money as you do to methamphetamine. The fact is, you stop it. My wife and I got involved with the Dave Ramsey thing not too long ago. You ever been involved with Dave Ramsey? It'll change your life. But you cut up those credit cards, it's pretty painful, baby. I call it mall withdrawal. You go through it, buddy. Because we get addicted to spending money, don't we? But here's the deal. If you don't want to quit spending money, there's always going to be excuse. If you don't want to quit drinking, there's always an excuse. If you don't want to save your marriage, there's always an excuse. Somebody's going to cut you off over here on I-20 coming back from work. Something's going to happen at your job. Your boss is going to be mean to you. Your spouse is going to say something that hurts your feelings. Brother, if you want to drink or you want to do meth or you want to spend money, guess what, man? You want to feed your addiction? There's always an excuse to fail, brother. I celebrate your choice. Now live with it and quit blaming others. You got what you want, now pay for it because there ain't nothing free. You want to get free? It's going to hurt. Any withdrawal is painful. But guess what? God's got the power, but you got to plan the win. That's it. Now here's the deal. If these four days you come in here and don't expect nothing to happen, God is not going to disappoint you because absolutely nothing will because God don't work where God ain't wanted. Now, these four days you come in here and say, I don't want to hear some preaching and singing. I want the walls to shake. I want my schools to change. I want our community to turn. I want God to do something. I want God to push the drug dealers off our high school campus. I want God to do something so unique this Christmas that I will remember Christmas 2010 for the rest of my life. You want that? God says, dude, I'm more than happy to give it to you, but you got to participate, man, and you got to get in the game. And if you come in here expecting it to happen, let me tell you, it probably won't be the way you thought because it never is. But I guarantee you when these four days are done, you'll be different, your family will be different, your school will be different, the church will be different, we'll all be different. I'll be benefited from what I will learn from you this week. And by the time it's all said and done, we'll look back and say we didn't have a meeting, we had a real spiritual awakening. And we want that, and I know that you do too. Now you say, well, then how do we get there? Well, I want you to look with me, and I promise I won't talk about sports all the time. I promise that. But I am going to tell you that a great way to get a team ready to play a ball game is sure a great way to get a church started for a revival. Because the Apostle Paul talks quite a bit more about sports than most people realize. And I want you to see what he says about being a championship disciple, a championship husband, a championship deacon, a championship elder, Sunday school teacher, a Christian musician. What he talks about being the best you can be for the glory of God. He says you need to understand that championship athletes have already figured that out. Paul uses the language of sports to talk about being a disciple and being effective and being successful and significant. So I want you to turn with me to a very short Greek paragraph. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. And I want you to see what the Apostle Paul says using the language of sports to talk about being a champion in life. And by the way, sometimes a person will say, well, there's really no sports in the Bible. Guys, you forget these are the most sports-crazed people that have ever lived in the history of the planet. Listen, at Texas Tech, we are happy. Our stadium seats 60,000. I really over at, uh, over at LSU, they've got a bigger stadium, and I love the games there. Uh, in fact, I've known Les Miles many years so from his Oklahoma State days. My son uh, went to Oklahoma State and was an athlete there uh, back in the Les Miles era. But uh, uh, our stadium hosts 60,000. We're really happy if we can fill that stadium six or seven times in the fall. That brings in a lot of money to the university. We're very satisfied if we fill it the six times, seven times, and then it basically sits for the rest of the year, and it's worth it to, uh, to the university. Do you realize the Colosseum in Rome seated 60,000? And Do you realize they filled it 350 out of 365 days during this period of time? You think about that. There is no venue in America today could do that. New York couldn't do that. L.A. couldn't do that. Chicago couldn't do that. 350 days a year, 60,000 people were in that stadium to watch athletic events. These are the most sports-crazy people that have ever lived. I teach on and off at some of our colleges in Texas, and when I was teaching Bible at Wayland Baptist University, did that for about 11 years as an adjunct professor, I told my students, you could do a whole semester 
on just the Greek words in your New Testament that come straight, that are picture words straight out of the uh, Olympic experience. Folks, the Olympics touched these people. There had been 750 years of Olympics before Christ is born in Bethlehem. These people know about athletics far more probably than we do today. Think of all your Greek sculptures and Roman sculptures that are discus throwers, wrestlers, charioteers, boxers, runners. These people are very sports aware. And the capital of the sports world is Corinth, the city that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is written to. Rome's the biggest city in the world. It's got a million people probably a million one, probably a million hundred thousand people. It's about the size of Dallas. It's huge. It's not spread out because they're not mechanized. They're all bunched up tight. They're on foot, but there's a lot of people there. The second largest city in the world is Corinth. It's got 750,000 people in it. It's the size of Tulsa. It's a big city. And not only that, but it hosts the world championships. They were called the Corinthian or Ithmian Games. Listen, man, you couldn't go to the Olympics. It was a tough ticket, like getting a Super Bowl ticket. I mean, Super Bowl tickets are $900 a piece if you can get a face value ticket. Those tickets of that week will be between two dollars and $5,000 a piece. The average person couldn't go to the Olympics anymore and go to the Super Bowl today. But you could go to the World Championships. And if you lived in Corinth like these people do, you're seeing the athletes every day during the uh, games. You're seeing them in the Agora, man. They're, they're down there buying apples and oranges down in the marketplace with everybody else. You could have got their autographs. Listen, man, these Corinthians are the sports knowledgeable people, and Paul knows this. I mean, they, they see these athletes every year. It's the World Championships. It's held every year to warm up for the Olympics. Listen, man, Paul knows it. And Paul says, you guys want to be better husbands and dads? Absolutely. You guys want to be better moms and grandmothers? Absolutely. You want to be a better Sunday school teacher? You want to be a better worship leader? You want to be a better coach or teacher? You want to see your teammates and your friends get saved and your school change and your youth group grow? Absolutely. You guys want to live more morally and ethically? You want to maximize your potential as a musician, as an academic, in business? You want your business to grow? You want to make the most money you can make ethically and morally? Man, these people are going, yeah, dude, who, would, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to be successful? He says, good. Then you do what the athletes already do and at the championship level on the track, the field, the diamond, and the court. And you watch the same success that follows the championship athlete on the field. You watch that follow you in your marriage. You watch that follow you in your business. You watch that follow you in your Sunday school class or in your choir or whatever it is you do because the same principles that create success on the court field dominant track are the same principles that make for a dangerous and a powerful discipleship walk. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Beginning in verse 24, down through 27 is one Greek paragraph in the inerrant word of God. And so they all go together. Look what he says, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run it in such a way that you may win or obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is disciplined, temperate in all things, doing it to obtain the perishable crown or wreath, but with the imperishable. Therefore I run not without aim or uncertainty, I box or fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline, I buffet my body and bring it into subjection, make it my slave, lest after having preached to others, I myself should not be disqualified. Four verses, four truths. Hope you'll listen to them closely, maybe jot them down, they'll work remembering. Here's the first one, verse 24. What does a championship athlete know that a championship follower of Christ needs to know? Verse 24, he says champions don't run, he says they run to win. And then he shifts to what's called the Greek imperative mood. And he says, run to win. You say, what are you talking about? The reason God created and developed the Greek language, and that's what your New Testament is really written in, is that Greek does things that English cannot do. In English, the only thing you can get from the written word is meaning. In our language and every other language in Western Civ, Mood is determined by listening to the voice of the speaker, just the way our language has evolved. In other words, I can't get mood through the written page in English or Spanish. That's why you have to have the, uh, that's why you have to have the smiley faces. You know why you have to have the smiley faces? Because that's giving you mood. In other words, a text can be misconstrued. Have you ever gotten a text from somebody and looked at them and said, called them up and said, why are you mad? And they say, well, I wasn't mad, I was kidding. And they'll say, well, why don't you next time put a smiley face on it because I thought you were angry. Do you know why we have to have those, uh, those, those smiley faces? Because you can't transfer mood in English 
through a text. It's impossible. You know what makes Greek so great? Unlike any other language in the Western world, meaning and mood are determined by word order and spelling. No other language will do it. We do not have to have a DVD or a CD of the Apostle Paul to get his meaning and his mood. In Greek, it's clear as a bell. Let me give an example. My mother's a retired school teacher. Let's say I'm sitting on the couch watching a movie or a football game. My mother comes in and says, John, why don't you take out the trash? Well, her meaning's clear, take out the trash. By saying it fast and going up, I know it's suggestive. You say, what do you mean? I know her mood is, get around to it. It'll be okay. Would you just take care of it sometime? Wait till the half or, you know, wait till the movie's over. But it's suggestive. What if my mama had said the same words like this? John, why don't you take out the trash? Oh, now, I don't know what that would have meant at your house. At my house, that meant I brought you into this world. I can take you out. I don't care whether it's a halftime or not. Get your hiney up and get this taken care of right now. Now, my mother is a retired school teacher about this tall. I am still scared of that woman, okay? I'm telling you. Now, here's my point. The only way you can tell the difference is to hear her. You don't have to have that in Greek. That's what makes Greek so cool. God was really, really smart. In Greek, here's what it says. It's clear as a bell. Paul says, champions don't run, they run to win. And then he shifts to what's called the command imperative mood. And he says, run to win. It's as clear as a bell in Greek. Paul says, God ain't asking, God's telling. The call of a disciple is that you not be satisfied to make the team, but you get out on that field and play. The call of God is for you to pursue excellence. And can I tell you why lost people don't listen to us? I'm going to tell you why. Because I look at our lives, brother. And you are way too stinking happy to just make the team. If you ain't going anywhere, nobody can follow you. Haven't you figured that out? Look, my dad was a coach, and I've been around coaches all my life. You find a kid whose highest ambition is just to make the team, get a letter jacket, cut him. Cut him. He'll ruin the whole team. Worst player on that team's ambition has got to be to get on that field. He may never get there, but he will push the kid in front of him, who push the kid in front of him, who push the kid in front of him, and that's how you win a state or a national championship. You find a kid whose highest ambition is to make the team, cut him, brother. He'll mess your whole team up. God looks at you and says, when did you get satisfied, just come up here on Sunday morning and shake hands with all your friends, listen to a nice little sermon, nice little song, Eat a little uh, barbecue over in the fellowship hall and then go back to your life, man. God says, what is up with that? That is why lost people stay away. I didn't grow up in church. I got saved to Fellowship of Christian Athletes when I was 17. Look, I want to tell you something, man. There are a lot of people out there. They don't hate God. I didn't. The Christians I knew just weren't going anywhere. I had to run into some Christians that actually understood the principle of run to win. The call of God is not for you to go to heaven when you die. The call of God is you make a difference on this planet between here and there. And man, we got to get back out on that field. When's the last time you looked at God and said, I'm not just satisfied to go to heaven when I die and get a spiritual letter jacket. God, I want to be the best I can be. I want you to don't just save my soul, coach my, coach my character. Listen, show me how to cut a tenth of a second off my time so that, man, I can be a better dad. I can be a better husband. I can be a better grandfather. I want my players to be different if I'm a coach. I want my coaches to be different if I'm a player. I want to pass through life and the school be different because I taught there and went to school there. Listen, God, coach me, maestro me. Don't let me just play the melody. God, if I'm flat, tell me. If I'm sharp, tell me. I want to play it the way you wrote it. I want my life to make a difference. Professor me, God, if two plus two is not five, I don't want to go through my life living that way just because, well, that's how everybody else does it around here in Louisiana. No, you know what? That's not good enough. If two plus two isn't five, get in my face and professor me. Don't just save me. Teach me. Man, I want to go on to spiritual trig. I want to go on to spiritual calculus. I want to go on to spiritual physics. I want my life to count. I'm interested in being significant. And if that's not, if you, and listen, I love you, but if, if you're not hearing that, I don't think I can help you. Brother, I'm telling you, man, lost people are not turned off by God. They're turned off by Christians' mediocrity. That's what turns them off, brother. They just don't perceive you got anything they need. 
and they got their friends. Their friends are down at the Hooters at the topless bar at the golf course. If all you offer is friendship, why on earth would I want to come up here and be with your friends? I got my friends. You got to offer them something more than friendship, brother. You got to offer some excellence. Show them you got something they don't have. They'll start listening to you because you're going someplace. But you ain't going anywhere. Get off other people's backs for not listening. They don't owe you that. When's the last time you looked at God and said, Father, I know I'm not perfect and I know I never will be, but show me how I can today take a step toward excellence for the glory of God. Dude, I want to tell you something, man. Your life, will, your life will completely change when you start to think like that. How about second? Verse 25. Second principle. You've got to get some discipline, dude. He says, man, the athlete disciplines body, mind, spirit, character, relationships to win a perishable crown. Listen, in the ancient world, they didn't give gold medals and trophies. In the ancient world, they gave crowns made out of leaves. Those leaves are going to turn to dust within the athlete's lifetime. Two words for crown in the Greek New Testament. One's the word diadem. That's the crown of a king. But whenever you read about Christians getting crowns, it's never that Greek word. It's another Greek word. It's the word for the Olympic crown. That's another example of sports that's all over the New Testament. Look, dude, that Olympic crown is made of leaves. It's going to turn to dust within the athlete's lifetime. You remember the Athens 2004 Olympics? The Greek government went to great expense to make sure that the athletes got those crowns, that they were teaching the ancient Olympics to the world. Look, Paul says if an athlete will discipline his mind, his body, his spirit, her character, to win a crown that's temporal, that's going to turn to dust within his lifetime or her lifetime, Paul says, can't you get at least that discipline for the imperishable crown? Dude, you ain't playing for no state championship. You're not playing for a national championship. You're playing for the future of your kids and grandkids. You're playing for this community. You're playing for the glory of God and to make the name of Jesus famous. God says, dude, if you can't get at least as disciplined about that as you can about a football game, my soul, there's something messed up about you. <clears throat> Got to get some discipline, brother. I tell college athletes, love God. And they call back, hate sin, Mr. Randalls. I'll say, love God, gentlemen, and they'll call back, hate sin, Mr. Randalls. I'll see them on campus, and I'll say, love God. They'll say, hate sin. What am I teaching? I'm teaching this verse. Don't you understand? You can't just love God, man. You've got to get some discipline and hate sin. The problem with most of us is we do love God. Most of the people in northwest Louisiana are church people, man. This is the buckle of the Bible belt. There's churches about every 15 yards in northwest Louisiana. I mean, you got more churches than you got 7-Elevens. You aware of that? It's easier to get a Bible in Louisiana than a cup of coffee. That's the honest truth. Now, here's the bottom line. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just telling you, we all love God here. The problem is we also love sin, and that's the reason we don't have any power. You can't love God and love sin. Look, everybody in jail gets saved. Isn't that true? Hey, now, don't bow up on me if you do jail ministry. I'm for you. I preach in prisons. I'm, I love to preach in prisons. People get saved. But I remind those men and women in that prison, you can't just love God. Everybody loves God when they're hurting. You've got to also now go the next step, get some discipline and hate sin. Because if you love God and you love sin, you'll be back in the county jail in six weeks. <laughs> You've been smoking dope and you get pulled over on I-20, state trooper walking up to your truck, you be believing in God right now. Because you're scared. Hey, <laughs> you can't just love God, man. you got to hate sin. Now, some of you looking at me, I can see it. I don't love sin. No, you don't love other people's sins. You just love yours. <laughs> I hate your sin. I just don't hate mine. Hey, I hate divorce. I've been married 34 years. I'm not interested in getting divorced. I couldn't find another woman to put up with me. So I can preach against divorce because I'm not interested in it. I can preach against drugs. I was a marginal athlete. I couldn't afford to do drugs. So I didn't ever do them. So I love that. I hate on drugs, baby. 
because I'm not interested in doing drugs. Whew, I can hate on bankruptcy because I've never been bankrupt. Man, I can hate on abortion. Whoo! Because I'm not a woman. It's really easy to hate a sin you can't commit, isn't it? I'm a real big man. But when some guy gets up and starts preaching about overeating and gluttony, that's when I bow up and find an excuse to go to the restroom, not have to stay in there. You know why? Because <laughs> that's my sin. I've been fighting my weight my whole life. I have my drug of choice, carbohydrates. <laughs> I mean, who needs crack and heroin when you can have jalapeno cornbread with real butter? Now, that's a Rocky Mountain high. <laughs> now, I want you to hear me. I'm not special because I hate methamphetamine and abortion. I wasn't going to do those anyhow. I got to deal with the sin I like, which is overeating, and I got to fight with that one every day of my life. I ain't special because I hate sins I hate. I'm special because I begin to get a little discipline and deal with the sins I like. And everybody in this room has got a sin you like. Some of you that would never sleep around, if you don't get put on the committee that picks the carpet for the auditorium when they renovate, you're mad for 20 years. <laughs> well, I hit on that one, didn't I? <laughs> and if you're that angry person, you need to get over it. I mean, who picked this? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It looks great. It's fine. I'm just teasing you. Now, here's the point. Look, where do you get off thinking doing dopes more serious than holding a grudge over a church committee? It's just that they got their drug of choice and you got yours. What's the difference? It'll all destroy you. Some of you that would never steal, you gossip about people behind their back in the name of ministry and prayer. No praying goes on, just a whole lot of character defamation. Where do you get off thinking stealing is more serious than gossiping? It's just that you got a different drug of choice. That's all the difference is. It'll all destroy you. Quit hating on other people's sins and figure out what yours are, man. Discipline them out of your life. And discipline good stuff into your life. It ain't easy being a strong disciple. Whoever told you it was lied to you anyway. Quit looking for the easy way out. Or you'll be a user of the powerful all your days. The powerful don't want to be comfortable. The powerful want to know. Knowledge is power. Truth sets free. But you know why we're afraid of truth? Because truth is violent. And truth is penetrating. And truth causes you to get outside the box. But truth will set you free, man. And the world is filled with slaves. It's time for you to stop being one of them. Excellence, discipline. How about the third thing? 26. Got to set some goals, baby. Set some goals. No runner runs without aim. No boxer buffets the air. You don't get up there like Daffy Duck and swing your arms. You don't get any points for swinging your arms. Why does a real doctor dance and prance? Because you don't get any points unless you land the punches, baby. you got to land the punches. Somewhere you fell for the lie that if you expend energy, you should be rewarded. Biggest mistake we ever made was start giving everybody a trophy just because they participated. It's ruined a whole generation of young people that have to overcome that. You don't get rewarded because you expended energy. You gotta produce a bottom line, brother. You gotta produce a bottom line. You gotta produce something, man. You gotta grow something with your life. Are you growing anything with your life, man? Set some goals. Don't get up there and just sling your arms. Land the punches. You gotta have a plan. No runner runs without aim. They don't care how fast you are. If you leave the blocks early, they disqualify you. They could care less how fast you are. You better have the goal of knowing what the rules are of the 100-meter dash. you got to stay in your lane or they're going to cut you, man. They're going to take you out. You're not going to get anything. Just you, But I ran and I'm fast. doesn't matter that you participated and it doesn't matter that you were talented. If you can't keep the rules because you don't have any goals, you still get disqualified. Hey, didn't, didn't Solomon say it in Proverbs where there's no goal setting, where there's no vision casting, even God's people perish. Look, just because you're a believer doesn't mean you're going to have a successful life. Jails are full of Christians. I can tell you about a whole bunch of Christians that are broke. You want to maximize your earning potential? You better have a plan. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to have influence. God don't owe you that. What plan are you from? You better have a plan if you want influence. Hey, 
You want to have a good marriage someday if you choose to get married? You've got to have a plan. Girls, the world lies to you. You're not going to stumble on Mr. Right. There is no Mr. Right. Ask your mother. <laughs> and boys, there's no Miss Right either. <laughs> but don't ask your dad. He won't tell you the truth. He's afraid of your mother. <laughs> you know what there is? There's imperfect people that make it work. I had a college kid come up to me. I think he was at the University of Oklahoma. I can't remember. He walked up to me and he said, Randalls. College kids don't even know my first name. They just call me Randalls. In fact, my wife don't even know my first name. She calls me Randalls. And my grandbaby, my son, he's a college minister in Lubbock. I've got a new grandbaby, and uh, they're teaching her to call me Grandles. I mean, nobody even knows my first name. This college kid comes up, and he goes, Randles, I want you to pray for me. I'm praying that I find the perfect woman. I go, really? And he pulls out a two-page list, single space, front and back, all the things he wants in this woman. And I read through this, and I hand it back and say, well, I hope you never find this woman. And he said, why? Because I said, if she exists... She ain't going to have nothing to do with you. I said, why don't you tear this up and start working on your own character a little bit and quit judging others. Now listen to me. Girls, guys, you're not going to find Mr. or Miss Right because you're not Mr. or Miss Right. What you're going to have to do is someday you're going to have to work at a relationship that's going to take work. You don't fall in love. You fall in like and lust. Love's not a feeling anyway. Read the love chapter. It's got nothing to do with feelings. I mean, college students always want me to read the love chapter at their weddings. Down here in the south, they want me to read the love chapter. Up north, it's the love chapter. Down here, it's the love chapter. <laughs> I say, have you ever read the love chapter? There's nothing in there about feeling. It says love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love's a choice, man. Love's a decision. Look, Kelly and I have been married 34 years. We don't always like each other, believe me. She's redheaded and as aggressive as I am. Sometimes she gets down on her hands and knees and begs me, come out from under the bed and fight like a real man. <laughs> you can't bounce the same checkbook, raise kids to adulthood, go through the highs and lows of life and like each other all the time. We don't always like each other. What does that make? We made a decision we're going to love each other. It's called commitment. And can I tell you the times of dislike were never that many? And I'm 54, and she's 52, and we're finally maturing. And like is the icing on the solid foundation that got us through, which was commitment. I don't always like God, man. How can I? Sometimes he doesn't pet me and pat me. Sometimes he doesn't get me out early. It's funny to watch everybody start... It's like Pavlov's dogs. You know exactly when it's 12 o'clock. It's like you ring the bell and everybody starts slobbering. It's the funniest thing in the world. Because see, we didn't come up here to be with God. We came up here to be with our friends. It's a social event. Whether God shows up or not, it's immaterial. We came to be with our friends. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just telling you why the lost people stay away. They already have their friends. They're down at Hooters. See, if all you offer is friendship, you've already lost the game. Because they don't want to come up here and be with your friends. You don't have better friends than they do, just different. You've got to offer them a little bit more than that, man. You've got to show them that you're about a little bit more than friendship. You've got to show them that you're about power. Or they won't ever come around here. Or any church. I'm not picking on your church. It's true across the world. Look, sometimes God makes me feel good. And sometimes, like today, he talks to us about hard things. And when he does, it doesn't feel good. That's okay. 
It's okay. It's all right to look at God and say, God, I don't like it. God, this doesn't make me feel comfortable. This doesn't make me feel great about being where I'm at. God, this is roughing up the paint, man. This is cutting down into the sore. God, right now, I don't like you. That's all right. But the next phrase is, but God, I love you. You're my coach. You're my father. You're my husband. You're my leader. You're my maestro. You're my professor. You are God. And it don't matter how I feel. It ain't about how I feel. It's about who you are and who I am in you. I'm sticking. Now, you got the guts for that. You can get large. And you can get influential. And you can have significant lives. And I'm looking at your eyes, man. You got sharp eyes be a real shame if you let yourselves be average. That'd be a terrible shame. Well, then there's one last one, and we're done, man. Excellence, discipline, goals. But let's look at verse 27. We're finished today. Look what he says. He says, wouldn't it be a shame to come in first and still be disqualified? You say, can somebody come in first and still lose? Sure. Reggie Bush won the Heisman. Took five years, but he had to give it back, or chose to give it back. I respect him for that. I'm hoping nothing else comes out on the kid from Auburn, and I hope he doesn't have to give his back. But you can get a Heisman and have to give it back. You can be disqualified on the Day of Judgment. It does happen in life. So you see, the last word from the Apostle Paul is, you know what's more important than being excellent, disciplined, and goal-minded? Though those are important things. Making sure that on the day of judgment, when you stand before Christ, that you are truly a member of the team. You've got to make sure that your soul is saved. More important than excellence, discipline, and goals is making sure you're on the team. Look, when I speak to these college football teams, they're always in the lobby of the hotel. We do the chapel either on Friday night after the Friday night meal or Saturday morning before the pregame meal. It's usually up in the ballroom. That hotel is filled with all the faithful because they want to get as close to the team as they can get. Those people in that lobby, they know way more about that team than I do. Because they're fans. I work with all the teams. But just because they know more than I know, that don't get them into that room with that team. There's only one thing that can get you in that room with that team, and that's a personal relationship with that coach. I remember doing the Red River Shootout in Dallas for the OU Sooners against Texas. I work with OU every year. have worked with the Longhorns through the years. But only once have I done that particular game, which is a huge game. And uh, the Sooners always stay in the Renaissance Hotel over there in Dallas. It's the one on Stimmons that looks like a lipstick case. If you want to stay in the hotel with the Sooners, the Renaissance bumps those rooms up to $1,000 a night, and you have to buy three nights or they won't rent to you. So that means that that place was packed with Sooner faithful who are willing to pay a minimum of $3,000 for the weekend just to be close to the team. I'm sitting, I'm from Dallas, so I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for the Sooners to arrive. And I'm listening to them. Some of these people have $1,000 worth of Sooner stuff on. One guy had a bow tie that flashed and played Boomer Sooner. That's messed up. I'm listening to them talk. They know far more about Bob Stoops than I know. They knew what junior high Bob Stoops went to. I don't know that. I know he lived in Ohio. They knew what grades he got. They knew, they knew what Adrian Peterson's shoe size is. I don't know Adrian Peterson's. Those people knew way more about the Sooners than I know. And then all of a sudden, the word came, the bus had arrived from the airport. The Sooners are here. The Sooners are here. And then all these people are starting to converge and outstep 10 of the largest Oklahoma State troopers I've ever seen. Now, Oklahoma's like Louisiana. Those troopers got those flat military hats. In Texas, our guys got cowboy hats that say, welcome to Texas. In Oklahoma, it's those flat hats that say, I want to give you a ticket. I mean, they're scary looking. <laughs> Louisiana's got them scary looking hats. 
And I'm telling you, man, income 10, and they're all big, six foot three, six foot four, they've all been hand picked. And man, they block the entrance. And here comes the team and all these people rushing over. Oh, Adrian Peterson. Oh, Coach Stoops. Oh, oh, Coach Venables. Oh, oh Josh Heupel. Oh, these guys are blocking them off. Man, I'm just in the corner staying out of the way. When it all calms down, Sooners have gone up to third floor to have their meal. I'm supposed to eat with them and then I'm supposed to do the chapel. Well, I quietly now walk up to third floor, but I got a problem. Third floor is blocked up behind one of those, you know, those nice hotels have those velvet rope things with the brass stands. Those guys standing behind that. I walk up and start to undo that rope. That trooper grabs me by the wrist and says, Sir, what do you think you're doing? I said, Sir, I'm about to go in the ballroom with the team. He goes, Really? <laughs> he said, Let me see your driver's license. I go, What? He said, sir, let me see your driver's license. I'm like, flat hat, I'm scared, man. I hand it to him. He pulls out a clipboard. He goes down the list, finds my name and my driver's license number, hands it back, opens it up, and says, Mr. Randalls, they're waiting for you. As I stepped past him, I looked at him and said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, if my name hadn't been written on that clipboard, would you let me pass this rope? He said, not a chance. I said, but I'm supposed to be team chaplain today. He said, I don't care if you're Santa Claus. He said, between now and tomorrow, when this team goes to the game, 2,000 people will try to get past this rope because they will say that God gave them in a vision the play that will beat Texas, and they've just <laughs> got to get it to Coach Stoops. He said, Adrian Peterson will have 8,000 people who will all say they're related. 7,000 of them will be white, but they will still say that they're related to him because they want to meet Adrian Peterson. He said, our job is to make sure those 2,000 people don't get past this rope. I said, would you have at least gone to the door and got Coach Stoops to come out? Because if you have seen me, he'd let me in. He said, bother Bob Stoops on the Friday night before the Texas game? when millions of dollars of BCS money is on the line for the university, you name it out on this list, I don't bother Coach Stoops. And as I walked in, I thought, that's what Paul's saying to us. Don't you understand that a day's going to come when every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room is going to die? And when that day comes, I hope it's a long time, but it will happen, and when it does... You're going to stand in front of that velvet rope and back there's the ballroom where they're having the marriage supper of the Lamb and Coach Jesus Christ is going to be in there and standing, holding a clipboard are going to be those angels. That clipboard's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name's not written on that clipboard, brother, it don't matter how much you knew intellectually about Jesus Christ you're not getting past that velvet rope. And I think those angels at the gates may have those flat Louisiana State Trooper hats on. <laughs> and you say, but let me in because I'm wearing an Adrian Peterson jersey. I'm wearing a Jesus shirt. And they're going to say, you think having a Jesus shirt on means you got a personal relationship with Jesus? But you don't understand, I taught Sunday school and my, te my, my students said I was a great Bible teacher. Listen, man, it don't matter how much you know, I guarantee you, the only thing that can get you past that rope in football is that you got your name on that clipboard because you got a relationship with that coach. Can I tell you what's more important than being excellent, disciplined, or goal-minded? Though those are important things. You got to make sure your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And in Louisiana, going to church is what we do. That don't mean nothing. Meanest people in Louisiana go to church every Sunday. And Texas, too. I'm asking you, is there a moment not when you joined a church or got baptized or christened or sprinkled or immersed? Is there a moment when you said, I'm a sinner, you're the Savior, and you really got saved? If not, I'm glad you're at church because... This is way better for your marriage than being down at the Hooters. Really, it is. But there's no power in it. 
unless you get saved. And once you accept Christ, now add excellence. Now add discipline. Now set some goals. Dude, you could own this town. It's not that big. You could change your school. You could change your school. You really could, you could leave a legacy that would last for a generation. That's your power. But it's not going to happen unless, unless you do the very things that an athlete does if he or she wants to win a championship. Championships aren't accidents, man. And the talented teams rarely win the championship. It's usually good teams that want it really, really bad. How bad do you want it to be a better dad, better husband, better influence, a better man? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Life's too short to be average. And it's too much fun to have influence. You've been excellent listeners. But we're not special because we hear it. We're special because we do something with it. Even the demons intellectually believe. That don't make you special. That just makes you human. What you do with it, that's what matters. James said, be a doer of the word, not a hearer who deludes himself. Would you pray with me? With heads bowed and with eyes closed, I'm going to ask Brother John that you come. And I'm going to ask that your musician just begin to gently play. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to be walking out of here in two, three minutes and on our way over to have a good meal. And that's going to be a great time. But it's going to be a real shame if we go and get a good meal, but we didn't do something with what we've heard this morning. You heard God speak through some wonderful music. And God spoke to us through His Word. So what are we going to do with it? That's what determines our success or failure. We're not special because we hear. We're special because we do. So I'm going to boldly ask you to do something with what you've heard today. Pastor's here. He's available. He loves you. The altar's here and God's here. So I'm going to ask you to get outside the religion box, the Baptist box, the Northwest Louisiana box, and for a minute, I'm going to ask you to throw away religion and just obey God. Jesus said, confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. Do you know what that means? It means in the end, physical response is necessary to complete what's happening in the heart. I believe that with all my heart. That's why my wife wants me to wear the wedding ring. Asked her once, I said, why is this ring so important to you, sweetie? And she said, John, it's not the ring. It's just that when something's real in the heart, the body follows it. That's why the handshake and the look in the eye have meant something to men for thousands of years. Because in the end, if it's in your heart, your hand and your eye follow. I'm going to ask you to physically respond today. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to come forward. But I'll tell you this, if you've never received Christ or you're not sure, I'm going to ask you to physically respond. I'm going to ask you to get up and come and connect your body to what's happening in your heart. Grab pastor by the hand and say, I want to, I want to make sure my soul, I want to make sure my soul is saved and my name's on that spiritual clipboard. I want to know that I'm a member of God's team, that I have a personal relationship. Be the greatest day of your life. You may have been a member of this church all your days, but you've been worrying about this for a long time. Or you may be a visitor today. I'm going to ask you to come and settle it. There are a lot of us men in this room and women who'd say, Randalls, I've given God my soul. My name is written on the clipboard. But God's dealing with me about excellence. God's dealing with me about discipline. God's dealing with me about my character and about my goals. And you need to come and kneel and say, God, I'm back. Or God, take me deeper. Or God, forgive me. Maybe you just need to come and say, God, I'm dry. Feed me. Speak to me. I'm thirsty. Maybe you need to come with her. She needs to see you pray, brother. Maybe you need to come with him. Maybe you don't need to kneel. Maybe you need to lay on the floor and cry out to God. You say, well, what are people going to think if I lay on the floor? I don't know. Who cares? When you stop worrying about what people think, that's when the power comes. you got to get way over that, man. 
Father, don't let us leave here the same as we came in. Take us out different. And God, start with me. I want to be a better dad, a better husband, a better grandfather. I want to be the man you call me to be for my students. I want you to be, be me to be what I need for these folks this week. I pray, God, don't let me leave here the same as I came. And do the same with my friends. The altar's here, ladies and gentlemen. The moment's here. It'll pass quickly. You do what you do. You do what you do. This is your moment. You ready? Let's stand to our feet. And as we stand, Brother John, if you'd lead us a little bit, just begin to sing. You come.